So thank you all for coming. We'll do um, some quick introductions from the coordinators and then we'll get right on to the program because we have a lot to cover in two hours. So I'm Sarah Hirsch. I'm the agriculture extension agent for University of Maryland in Somerset County on the Lower Eastern Shore. And then Ray and Neef, do you want to introduce yourselves real quick? Sure, I'm Ray Weil, I'm soil scientist and uh, teach and do research at the University of Maryland College Park. Hi, and I'm Neve Short. I'm the field school director with Future Harvest, a region-wide sustainable agriculture nonprofit. And I'll go over real quick uh, the agenda for today's meeting. So we're going to start off with a couple polls just to we don't have time to go around and introduce everybody like we would like to. So we'll just do a couple of polls to kind of get a feel for who's attending today. And then we're going to introduce the organic grain research trial that University of Maryland and Future Harvest and some other partners have been working on. And we're gonna get some field perspectives from that trial as well. Then we're gonna do some soil quality demonstrations. And then we're gonna get into a discussion on weed management in organic grain and then business planning and marketing for organic grain. We have um, some organic growers, some conventional growers and some ag service providers. If you are a grower, how many years experience do you have farming? So split right across the board there, um, everywhere from um, very new to farming to very experienced with 21 plus years farming. So that's interesting. All right, our next poll is going to be um, from your experience either farming or working with farmers for the ag service providers out there, what do you think are the biggest barriers to organic farming or to adopting organic practices? And you are allowed to select more than one answer for this one. All right, so weed control, number one, and then fertility, acquiring needed equipment, markets and regulations are a little bit lower. So that's pretty interesting. That I'm going to um, kick it, um, hand it over to Dr. Weil, and he's going to talk about the organic transition research project that they have around the state. Okay, am I sharing my screen with you? Yep, I believe so. I can see it. I can see Not it. in presenter mode. Not in presenter mode. There we go. Now, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, since since the advent of COVID, I've gotten pretty good at sharing my screen in presenter mode with with uh, people. So uh, hi, with I just uh, want to kind of uh, go over what our project is researching and and what we're trying to do. Basically, we're trying to come up with strategies to maximize profitability and ecosystem services and soil health during the three year transition to organic. So if a farmer wants to switch over either the whole farm or field at a time, uh, we wanna figure out the best ways to do that uh, and uh, also reduce risks and barriers. Uh, and it's worth mentioning the starting point, uh, being that we're in Maryland, we're in a state where just about all of our grain farmers uh, that are not organic, are using some form of no-tillage, the great majority of them, and almost everybody is using cover crops, at least in some of their fields, as often as they can. So this is different from the rest of the world and the rest of the U.S., uh, where most people are, most grain farms are starting from a, a, a fair amount of tillage, maybe conservation tillage, maybe full tillage, and a relatively small percentage of farms are still using cover crops. So we don't want to take steps backwards in going organic. So there are, you know, barriers. The reasons why not everybody's jumping in for, you know, thirty dollars soybeans and twenty dollars corn. Uh, there are <laughs> barriers to making this kind of con uh, conversion. And first of all, it's a learning curve. Uh, it's a different way of farming. A lot of the tools that conventional farmers are used to, or they're not allowed to use, so that takes some time. Uh, there are issues with marketing, and as our poll showed, you know, uh, weed control is one of those, one of the big issues. Uh, and a lot of farmers don't have the uh, equipment uh, on hand, especially if they're just trying to transition a field or two at a time. 
So the strategies that we're comparing and testing out can be arranged along a, a, a gradient of, <clears throat> of input cost and disturbance. Uh, and the disturbance is mostly in the form of tillage. So the, the first treatment is pretty much standard organic uh, grain production using full tillage, uh, cultivating several times to control weeds, including cover crops uh, in, in there in, in a fairly standard way. Uh, and so that would be the, the treatment number one, which is sort of the maximal uh, disturbance actually, and it's typical of most organic grain production in, in the country or even in the world. The second uh, treatment attempts to reduce this, uh, reduce the, the tillage disturbance uh, to improve soil health and also increase the cover crop component, uh, you know, for that reason. So there, there's some tillage involved uh, when needed. They might cultivate for weeds uh, and we might try to intercede to get um, cover crops earlier. So we're gonna try to maximize the um, management of the cover crops. And then the third uh, option is attempting to be as close to no-till as possible with very little disturbance in, in the way of tillage, not using it if we don't really have to, uh, and maximizing the role of cover crops and the sophistication and intensity of the cover cropping. So we're gonna try to use mowing or rolling and crimping uh, to terminate cover crops instead of tillage. And then the fourth system is almost no disturbance. And uh, uh, we did do some disturbance when we started it, but a farmer wouldn't have to, you could do a no-till establishment of perennial hay crop like alfalfa and orchard grass is what we're using. And that could be your last non-organic um, uh, input could be say the burn down for that. And then you wouldn't have to do any disturbance at all for the entire transition period. And you could just harvest hay. So in the fourth year, and uh, we'll have to get an extension on our project to go into the fourth year, but we plan to do that. Uh, the, this land should all be uh, certified organic, having, uh, having gone through this process. And then we're going to plant organic corn, uh, which will be following the soybeans, which we're going to plant next year. So this would be in 2023. Uh, and that corn will act as kind of a bioassay to tell us how well we did with the previous three years. So they'll all, and with all the plants will be treated the same in the fourth year. So we started out uh, partly because of circumstances and when we got the grant and because of COVID and things, uh, we weren't able to get cover crops in the previous fall. So our first organic uh, crop was spring oats. As that was something uh, actually uh, Kevin uh, Conover at uh, CMREC suggested that. I thought that was a good idea of where we could start rather than lose a, a whole year of, of the grant time. So we grew spring oats and that uh, across the entire experimental site and on all uh, four sites. Uh, and, and that actually had some advantages. Uh, one big advantage is that it, it does a pretty good job of suppressing weeds initially because it's not a row crop. And also it enabled us to assess variability. So uh, we had uh, three treatments at the commercial farms, but they really didn't have the ability to try to grow hay or make hay. Uh, and so we only did the fourth treatment at CMREC and, and LESREC. Uh, I wanna just mention about this oats and how this helped us uh, with the variability because it has lessons for when you're doing research on your farm and trying to make comparisons I would always warn against saying, uh, you know, I'm going to do it this way this year and then compare it to something next year or two fields or even two halves of the field. This is an example of a field at, at Lesrick uh, near Salisbury where we harvested the oats. And this was the original cropping plan. Uh, let me get my pointer here so you can see it. So this was the original cropping plan, uh, but these treatments weren't established yet. The whole thing was planted in oats and then we harvested the oats according to these strips. And when we did that, you can see that there's something out of place here, right? The, uh, the red dots and the blue dots or the northern part, they had much higher yield uh, of oats than the southern part, which are the yellow and green dots, except for that one blue dot. That's this plot, 204. Uh, that's in the wrong, you know, it's like a kid's game, you know, what's in, what's in the wrong place here? Uh, so that blue dot's in the wrong place. And so we decided to fix that by moving this entire part of the experiment up and closing that gap. 
And so we ended up with a plan that looked like that, moving this out so that the all four of these treatments would be on the higher yielding soil. And uh, lo and behold, the NRCS soil map shows a soil boundary running right about where the oak yields dropped off. And this is a more poorly drained soil. And this is a better drained soil up here. So you can see that you know making a comparison between two halves of the field uh, might have inherent differences that have nothing to do with the treatment. So after oat harvest, uh, we took extensive uh, soil samples uh, down to 30 centimeters, that's, that's a foot, and divided these into four inch segments from the top down to the deeper one. Usually the last one is kind of a subsoil uh, sample. So these are uh, being archived and we're gonna be analyzing them, comparing what the soil looked like at the beginning and what the soil from the same areas looked like uh, after three years of transition. Uh, so we're gonna be doing a lot of soil health measurements including um, Biwek, uh, who's in the red behind the mask, uh, is now getting married in uh, Nepal, but he should be back. And he's going to be doing some microbial analyses and diversity analyses, as well as the, the usual soil health measurements. So the cover cropping started in the summer of 2020, as soon as we planted oats for treatment three, since that was the uh, cover crop intensive treatment, uh, we, we no-till planted a uh, diverse mixture of summer cover crops. So uh, you can see... Um, um, uh, sun hemp here, and uh, the other one that's kind of prominent here is uh, the, the white flowers, and that's from buckwheat. Well, buckwheat, uh, I think I knew this, but it's one of those things I knew it, but I didn't <laughs> remember it in time. Uh, buckwheat was flowering in the in the, in summer. Uh, that means it's going to go to seed, and it went to seed before we killed it in September. And it came back to bite us as a, as a weed that suppressed uh, corn. But th uh, the idea was we uh, actually uh, mowed this down and then planted a second cover crop, uh, radish, clover, rye cover crop in September uh, in, in as many of the sites as we could. We weren't able to do that everywhere. Uh, treatment one was tilled, as you can see. It's got some bare soil and we planted um, to kill the weeds and prepare the seed bed. And we planted Austrian winter peas, came up pretty well. And then uh, at most sites, we just happened to hit the weather conditions really nice for treatment two that had a rye crimson clover. And you can see we got a very nice stand of clover, well nodulated, it looked pretty good. Uh, so the treatment three is where we were trying to do some uh, special precision cover cropping. And here the, uh, the radish wasn't mixed, the seed wasn't mixed and, and drilled together, but it was planted in rows where the uh, corn was going to be planted. So the rest of the rye and the clover was uh, drilled and then the, the radish was planted in rows. Um, Sarah took most of these pictures. These are at Lesrec, just looking at them in different seasons. So with getting started and um, this is actually, it had a, another almost month to grow before we terminated it and planted. Uh, you can see the radishes didn't die. They were damaged, but they did flower. Uh, not a problem. I wouldn't worry about radishes in spring. And just ignore them. So to give you a better introduction to these treatments, let me um, quickly try to play this if I can. How does this work? I think I'm going to have to escape from this. There we go. Uh, play that. Hey, we're out here at the Poplar Hill uh, Lower Eastern Shore Research and Education Center with the University of Maryland. And this is the organic transition strategy experiment. I don't think we're seeing it again. Oh, we're not. Okay. Sorry. Let me, uh, let me try that I again. I can put up on mine too if you want. Well, I think I have to stop this share and start this share and then. Hey, we're out here at the Pop you see Hill, now? Uh, yeah. Lower Eastern Shore Research and Education Center with the University of Maryland. And this is the organic transition strategy experiment whereby we're trying to find ways that farmers can profitably and, and improve the soil during the three years uh, in which a farmer who's conventionally growing uh, grains and wants to grow organic has to spend three years using organic practices, can't use any synthetic chemicals, 
uh, but doesn't get organic pricing. And so we want to see how we could best do this and maintain soil health from the kind of no-till cover crop system that it would have been in. So what we're seeing here are the spring cover crops that were established last year. And we have four different systems that range from highly disturbed, pretty conventional, if you can say that, a conventional organic, which is based on a lot of tillage, to a system that gets through the transition uh, without uh, any tillage except up front. Uh, first treatment is here. This is a peat cover crop. We plan to come in, plow this up, uh, mix it in with the soil, kill it, and control weeds by cultivation. So there'll be a lot of soil disturbance. Uh, it was a fairly late planted cover crop and sort of moderately successful, I'd say. Uh, and this is pretty typical of organic grain production. The second treatment is over here. And you can see this is a multi species cover crop. Uh, this has got the uh, grass in it, which is rye, and it's got a legume which fixes nitrogen from the air. And this, we hope to be able to roll this down and break it and use just as little tillage as possible uh, while suppressing weeds primarily by competition. And so we hope to get a decent crop out of this. This was established fairly early in the fall, a little bit earlier than this one. So this is our third system, which uses still less disturbance. Uh, it's closer to a no-till system, uh, but organic. It's got a similar cover crop, but the difference is we, we tried to do some precision zone cover cropping by planting a row of radishes wherever we plan to plant the corn. You can kind of see that the radishes didn't die. They went to flowers, so the white flowers are from the radishes. But they produce this big nutrient-rich root, which was big and white like a daikon radish, but it, uh, normally dies during the winter. This one didn't quite back, so point to see. We plan to precision plant the corn right down the radish row and then roll the rest of this and try to grow this without using um, any, any uh, even organic herbicides, without having to buy fertilizer, and without having to do tillage or to minimize it. So this is sort of the lower input, but uh, we got an earlier start and this plant also had a really diverse summer cover crop last, last year. And then the fourth treatment, which basically has no disturbance after the first uh, tillage, uh, is, this, is an alfalfa grass hay. So it was established last summer. Uh, it's now big enough to cut. So we plan to cut hay from this three or four times a year, probably three times. And never do any tillage, uh, never should not have to do anything to control weeds other than the competition of the plants. So once this is established, this should be the most like a, it is a perennial vegetation that'll be in there and should result, we expect this probably will result in the best soil health at the end of the period of time and possibly the best profit. Although we won't be harvesting grain for three years, uh, the hay itself is worth quite a bit if we can find a way to get it to market. Well, I have to stop sharing and Start sharing. All right, am I sharing again, Sarah? You are. Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's those two questions you hear a lot in Zoom meetings, right? Can you hear me? And am I sharing? So, so uh, let's take a look at a little bit of the data and just go, go through this uh, quickly. Um, this shows the uh, dry matter of the cover crops uh, that you just saw. Uh, the ones you saw in the video were here at Lesrec. Uh, you can see there were some differences between sites. Uh, the peas generally produced quite a bit less. They were planted later. They were single species. Uh, but as we'll see, they had a lot of nitrogen in them. Uh, and we had quite a bit of variability in, that, in the other cover crops. Uh, Aaron Cooper's field was pretty darn wet that year, uh, both in fall and spring. And I think uh, the wetness uh, had uh, problems getting those cover crops established and there was a fair, fair amount of weeds in there as well. So that was probably accounted for some of those lower biomass. Uh, and this is the nitrogen content. Uh, so the nitrogen content, uh, this is in kilograms per hectare, but it's very close to pounds per acre. So some of the best cover crops had more than 150 pounds per acre of nitrogen in the tops, not even counting the roots. Uh, and uh, it, and Lesrec, even though the 
The biomass was quite different. They all had about the same amount of nitrogen. Uh, the peas uh, range from about 35 to um, over 100 in uh, CMREC. So we had a fair amount of nitrogen out there. The better cover crops, if this decomposed and released uh, during the season in time for corn to use it, uh, you know, 150 pounds of nitrogen should pretty much do it for nitrogen. Uh, and I don't think nitrogen was a big issue. The carbon to nitrogen ratios, which help determine how fast this is released, uh, were mostly pretty low. The pea was by far the lowest. It was because it had only legume in it. It didn't have any grass. And that probably decomposed and released the nitrogen the quickest, which may have given corn a, a good head start. Uh, just some pictures of what this looked like. Uh, this is where the video was taken. Uh, through a lot of Herculean efforts, uh, Dave Armitrout, who was the farm manager and does the farming here, was able to get a roller crimper, and uh, which was part of the plan. And, and in the last minute, he was able to get it. So the idea was to plant right down those rows of radishes. And uh, that looks crazy to a lot of farmers that haven't tried this, but uh, it, it works perfectly all right. These roots don't interfere. Uh, and so this is what it looked like after rolling it, the rollers in front of the tractor and, uh, and, plant, and planting it here. Um, and lo and behold, uh, a few weeks later, we had pretty decent stands. This is the, the same treatment already. Some weeds coming up, but not, not, not many weeds and a pretty good stand. Now that's before the geese got a hold of things and the weeds started to come up. So needless to say, this is farming. And... Uh, not everything goes according to plan, right? There's always going to be some issues along the way. So let's take a look at uh, some of the things that uh, that happened. So we did do a count of the corn plants to see what kind of stand we got. Uh, Dave uh, Cavanaugh, who's uh, up on the western shore in Piedmont soils, uh, fairly uh, heavy textured, quite different from the others. Uh, did a pretty good job here of uh, getting this planted and uh, had the least variability by far. He had pretty good stands, uh, a little on the low side. I think we were shooting, this is in plants per hectare. Uh, we were shooting for about 75,000, uh, which would be about 30,000 uh, plants per acre, uh, but the least variability. Some of these were very high. Here you can see that, that wet end of uh, Aaron's field had really poor stands. Most of this is just that one, that one strip. So there was a lots of variability uh, at some of these, and this accounted for some of the variability in yields. So if we take a look at the yields at the end of the year, what do we get? Again, this is kilograms per hectare, but the highest yields here are pretty darn good. They're up around uh, 170, 180 bushels per acre. So that's not too bad for an organic. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that's sort of a, a few of these strips. And these are pretty good sized plots, uh, but so some replications were pretty high. Uh, Aaron uh, did pretty well on that treatment one, which is pretty close to what he's used to doing. Uh, and he has all the tillage equipment and did a good job of uh, cultivating for weeds. So they did pretty, pretty nicely. Uh, the, these are our hand harvested uh, measurements. We also took uh, combine yield monitor measurements and I don't think I'll have time to go into those. But you can see there was also a lot of uh, uh, variability. Uh, what you're looking at in the picture is this plot, which was sort of the weediest, worst treatment three plot at CMREC here, which happened to be next to one of the best uh, uh, treatment two plots. So treatment two actually was pretty consistent, worked pretty well most of the time, looked like this, uh, which is not bad for it had no tillage. Uh, neither of these had tillage. Okay, so the, the yields did vary quite a bit. Uh, some pretty poor uh, in some individual plots, but overall in the neighborhood of uh, 75 to 100 bushels, some treatments more. Uh, we did a regression tree, which is some fancy statistics to see what of the things we measured uh, were accounting for this. We measured the corn emergence uh, in, in early spring, the stand density. We measured the plants at the time of harvesting in the zones that we harvested. And we also collected the weed dry matter as a measure of how much weed infestation there was. And it's fairly dramatic here is how these uh, regression trees split things up. Let me um, get my pointer out here so I can point what I'm talking about. So the, uh, there were 48 
uh, these large plots uh, up to 300 feet long. So they're pretty good sized plots. Uh, 48 of them in total with a mean yield of 66 kilograms per hectare. So we're talking over 100 bushels, uh, about 120 bushels. Uh, the first thing that split out were the five plots that, that had good stand densities, uh, better than 65,000 plants per hectare. They all yielded pretty well, over 10,000 kilograms per hectare. The other 43 plots that had lower stand densities had much lower yields. Uh, so stand density, getting a good even stand was the first thing. And like I say, some places it was wetness, some places with planter adjustment that maybe we could have done better, some places it was geese. And then the second factor was weeds. Uh, you know, 4,000 kilograms per hectare of weeds is a, a pretty good cover crop of weeds, a uh, pretty good stand of weeds. If you, if you had that, that much weeds, uh, it, then you, the yields were really pretty low, down around three or 4,000 kilograms. If we had less than that, they were up more like six or 7,000 kilograms, which is uh, around 100 bushels or so, a little over 100 bushels. So the really poor plots were the ones that had low stand density and high weeds, and that accounted for most of the, the problems that we had. Okay, let me turn it back to Sarah. I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll go on to the panel. All right. So and now have, I think we should, if there are any questions, of course, uh, maybe we should stop for a moment and take questions. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, or we may do the panel since that since that is also sure. about the same research and then um, pause after that to see if people um, have any questions about the research. Sounds um, good. And I don't think mm -hmm. I have anything in the chat um, yet. So mm -hmm. um, if we want to turn over to our panel, and these are the growers who actually applied and it was their land that the treatments were on. So we have Aaron Cooper, who's uh, near Salisbury. And then we have David Armantrout, who is um, also near Salisbury at the um, Lower Eastern Shore Extension Center, Research and Extension Center. And then we have um, David Cavanaugh, who um, I believe you're up around Frederick? North. Okay. Yep. So if, if you three um, want to just talk kind of about uh, which treatments do you think work the best from a management standpoint or observations you noticed working the land or which treatments required more or less cultivation, just kind of your impression about uh, those three different treatments, the ones that had more cultivations and the ones that had heavier uh, cover crops and less cultivations. The no-till treatments were definitely less work. Um and I didn't have to cultivate. Um, now this is first year transition, so there weren't any weeds to speak of in mine. Well, I guess um, uh, hare's tail was the one weed I had in some of the field. I don't know how many were actually in the plots, but um, but by the the yield was way reduced. I think my stands were low because um, I didn't have my um, closing wheels uh, pressure on my planter set. Um, enough to push down to close the row. So the furrow was kind of open, I noticed, <laughs> in the no-till plots, which is not good for corn. Um, so, you know, that's a big variable that happened to me. Um, and of course, the um, I didn't have, so normally I, with a conventional one, the treatment one, I cultivated twice and had pretty good weed control with just two row crop cultivations. Um, of course, that was the most fuel and time and wear and tear on tillage equipment in the field because I've this twice and cultivated twice. So uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, that this is something that sort of bothered me. Uh, I think at all of the sites, we had these four different treatments and four replications of each. And so just for practicality, each of the farmers set their planter one way and planted in very different conditions. Uh, how much difference do you think it would have made if you had planted all the treatment ones with the setting you thought was best for that and then planted all the treatment twos with the setting you thought was best for that? In other words, changed your, your you know, closing wheels and your down pressure and stuff based on the residue. I was just a asking what you, whether you think that would be possible and whether that would have made a difference, Aaron. Oh, it would have made a difference. I don't know that I had, I mean, it was just me out there. It would have taken me all day to do that. Yeah. Well, I realized that's why it wasn't done at any of the sites, but this is a, uh, this was definitely a problem 
uh, and I'm, I'm not sure whether everybody sort of set the planter for the till plot and then had problems with the with the no-till plots that had heavy residue or you see what I'm yeah. saying? That's, ha that's what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, so I, that's, that's kind of a bias in the research though. I think that's what happened at all the sites. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, uh, we, we need to think about how we can uh, sort of iron that out maybe. Anybody else have uh, Dave Armstrong? Did, did did you have that experience as well? Oh, we were able to adjust the planter between the, the different tillages. Um, with our planter, it was pretty simple. It took a few seconds, um, and I feel like the initial stand was terrific. Um, just had an issue with geese come in. So with your experience farming, uh, David Ironchart, which which treatment would you think would be the most realistic or the easiest or the less time consuming if if you were going to transition into land into organic? Um, it would depend greatly on your planner. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a standard planner, kind of like we do. Um, what? It wouldn't be a whole lot of variability, really, I don't think. Um, uh, I'd prefer no-till myself just because mm -hmm. um, it's a little more consistent, the soil. Mm -hmm. um, biomass, differences in the biomass or debris on the soil could be an issue, but if it's all pretty consistent, it should plant consistent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think it's... This is Dave Cavanaugh. I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot through this entire process um, of conversion, uh, partly because of the different kinds of plots. And it may be that there is no one answer for uh, everyone, that, that given the particular weed burden, maybe um, there's more tillage that needs to go on for a couple of years, given um, uh, perhaps the quality of the soil, maybe organic matter is high. Um, you know, there's there's uh, kind of uh, less of a need. Um, a, a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of different variables, and I, I think one lesson that I'm taking away from this entire process is that um, you know every circumstance is a little bit different. Um, uh, you have a lot of tools that you might be able to use, um, and it's not always um, apparent that there's one way to do it. I I, I know that. Um, you know, I haven't had the benefit of seeing David's fields, but I, I have seen Aaron's fields, and, and they're just very different than, uh, than what I'm experiencing up in Frederick. Um, while, so while there's commonality, there's also differences, and, uh, and I think one of the, the things that I'm, I'm seeing is just that, uh, and I think that, that, that will kind of guide kind of the answer to your question. Um, did you guys notice big differences in the weediness? Like, did you notice a correlation between the treatments that had more or a better stand of cover crops? Were there less weeds or did you see the same amount of weeds or maybe even more weeds that came from the cover crops? Like, what was your experience with the weeds? Because I know that was our number one issue in organic that came up in the poll. Definitely saw less weeds where the cover crop was good. Now I had some plots and some water holes that this this is the wrong field I've to be doing research on, but it's the one where the plots would fit and it was in transition. Um, but there was definitely pretty clean and the the probably more treatment, well, treatment two and three, but um there there weren't many weeds in those. But the same cover crop I planted on other parts of the field that um I had a lot of mare's tail in it just because it it seems to prefer uh, it's one of those weeds that prefers no-till um and but my conventional till was clean too so but you know from cultivation um and i was a yeah but well it's different when you get in organic and have some weed escapes multiple years I mean, this this field doesn't have the weed pressure that i do in some of my organic fields that have been you know had a weed seed bank <laughs> it's just not in this field yet so it's kind of hard to say um you know that it would be interesting to see these same treatments where there's a serious weed problem i agree with that Aaron. i my my own experience both from a weed 
control. Uh, I'm a huge advocate for cover crops. I mean, I, I think that uh, one the one lesson I've learned is the kind of the use of cover crops in a broad um, kind of range of, of reasons. Uh, one is weed control. The other is, uh, you know, just simple moisture retention. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I found just walking out in, in the uh, in the plots um, where there was a good cover crop that had been kind of uh, uh, pushed down, like it, it, there there was kind of more moisture. It was uh, just in better condition. And, uh, and I think the more that that can be replicated throughout a field uh, in, in the variety of different conditions, the better off uh, the, the overall crop will be. And, and in fact, I, I think that the yields uh, were better. Uh, like I had pretty good um, kind of adhesion uh, between seed and soil. Uh, and, uh, and that was, you know, I think that it was able to go through the cover crop and, uh, and that worked out fine. And um, uh, so I, I think that having that is is kind of good, kind of a, a good good place. And we do have a question that came in from an attendee. Um, have you all? And I guess this could go to our producers and also to Ray if you've worked on any research on this. Have you um, considered utilizing livestock to incorporate the cover crop biomass into the soil through hoof action and ruminant digestion, also to add microbes to the soil through the addition of livestock manure? I have. I would love to. I mean, I, I think that that's uh, uh, maybe a, a step or two down the road. Um, I don't have any livestock. I don't have any any. Uh, right now, uh, kind of fenced in fields where it could be uh, utilized, but it, but I think the the what I'm understanding from research is that that is the next step of of just kind of a really kind of good regenerative model. I mean, yeah, I haven't considered it. I think I've got too many variables going on. I don't don't need to add another one to it. To I need to figure out how to do. And I don't have fencing or livestock and there's nobody around with livestock in this area that would want to do that, I don't think. I mean, on a small scale maybe, but there's not somebody that's gonna, you know, take 150 acres of cover crop and multiple small fields and be able to put temporary fencing up. It's just um, probably not practical. Yeah, this is certainly an issue that came up when we were planning this project. Uh, if you have, Livestock, uh, this is a, a, certainly a good way to make cover crops pay. Uh, just the grazing value, uh, especially if you're finishing them, you can, you know, finishing uh, cattle on, uh, on livestock, uh, and having grass fed finished cattle and that you can retail is, can be very profitable, but uh, there are not many Maryland farmers that are in a position to do, do that. Uh, even some of our most established organic grain farmers uh, are thinking about it. Uh, so the closest we came was with the alfalfa. So that also presented a problem. Uh, so our grain production and our livestock production is pretty separate, especially on the Eastern shore. Uh, and so we had real issues um, just finding you know, farms that would have equipment to make a grain farmer normally doesn't have hay making equipment. And as we found, it's really hard to even get someone to do it in custom, uh, particularly because we were only talking about an acre or two of, of, of research ground. But even if you had a larger field, it, it, would, it presents a problem for us. So in theory, uh, that's an integration of livestock because you're producing livestock feed. Uh, but getting both the equipment and the markets <laughs> where you're going to is, is a real problem because you're not surrounded. Generally, grain farmers aren't surrounded by uh, farms with livestock. There's some, there's some uh, around around the shore, but uh, not many. Yeah. So that that's that's definitely a limitation. Uh, I I wanted to share my screen for a second about the Dave uh, Kavanaugh's question about um, about weeds. I did get data on that, so uh, which I didn't present, but let me present that. Am I sharing that? Yes, yeah, you okay. are. All right, go into presenter mode. Just just this one slide. I just just copied it out of uh, my stats there. So this is uh, looking at the farms individually and looking at the weed biomass. Now this is at the end of the season, so that's not the best measure of weeds. But 
if you were badly infested with weeds, there were a lot of them there at the end of the end of the season. And you can see at uh, at some uh, places, uh, you know, some of these low yields were probably due to weed infestation along with other problems. Although it's a chicken and egg, you know, if you have really poor conditions and a poor stand of corn, well, that, that's the weeds come in. But there was definitely more correlation at the uh, at CMREC and on Aaron's farm, I think, uh, especially for a couple of those low plots, than at uh, Dave Cavanaugh's farm. There really uh, weren't too many weeds there, and there wasn't uh, much correlation at all. And also at Lesrec, I don't think uh, the weeds ever got too far out of hand, and they didn't seem to be controlling the, the yield. So it, it it really did, kind of depended. So CMREC doesn't have any drainage issues. It's not wet. It's a sandy soil uh, and it's well drained. And so that, you know, uh, gave room for weeds to become the controlling factor. And I think at CMREC, we had some uh, buckwheat coming back that really inhibited the corn and that uh, you know, enabled additional weeds to come in. And then he had no good tillage, uh, cultivating equipment. Uh, and so we had uh, some real problems there, especially on the uncultivated. So that, I just wanted to show you that there, there's sort of a different level of problem <laughs> places, right? Great. Thanks, Ray. And we're going to shift gears a little bit here now and move a little bit into the soil health of the different systems. And we have a couple, I have a poll and then a couple demonstrations for that. And then we should have about 10 minutes for questions and answers about um, the whole um, organic research study before we move into our economics and weed management part of today's program. So on average, and this is kind of across, like just think across all of organic agriculture, would you think organic or conventional farming practices are better for soil health? And I know that this is gonna vary by farm, but just kind of think on average in general, which one would you say is better for soil health? All right. A lot of people don't want to admit which one they think is better, but we have about a 63% participation. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So, so these, poll, these polls are completely anonymous. We have no idea of who said what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we have about 75% uh, thinks that organic is better for soil health and 25% um, thinks conventional. Um, and that's um, interesting data. Yeah, well, I, I, the word organic is pretty well defined, but it always bothers me when you compare it to conventional because that's completely undefined, right? <laughs> so uh, Sarah, let me just interject here that what you're about to show us are soils that have the same cropping history, except for the treatments that were applied uh, in, the, in, the, in the one year with right. cover crops we just discussed. Yeah. So it, it, this, I think, is a much better comparison where you know that the cover crops are the difference between these samples. Yeah, and these videos were taken um, in the summer during the, when the corn was growing in the field. So all four of these were in corn when we took the samples. And the difference is from one to four, one had the most tillage and four had the, the least. Are you able to see that? Yep. So that one right here had the most tillage and then this one that Brandon's pouring the water in right now, these two had um, more cover cropping. And the one at the end here was the perennial um, hay mixture. So these metal trays were pushed straight down into the soil, kind of like cookie cutters. They're hollow on the bottom and they have a cutting edge around the bottom. So it wasn't that we shoveled soil into these containers. We were able to push them straight down into the soil and remove an intact chunk of soil that did not have that soil structure changed in any way.
with the soil that was most disturbed, a lot of water is run off and very little water has infiltrated down through that soil. As we get to the less disturbed soils with more cover crops, we're getting less water that's running off of that soil. as well as more water that's infiltrating down through the soil. Again, treatment three had less disturbance, more cover crops even, and we see water that's having infiltrated down through the soil and less that ran off. And then finally, the perennial hay treatment had very little water that ran off and more water that infiltrated down through the soil. All right, so for, for these here, you could kind of see, um, as would be expected, we had more running off the surface um, where there was more tillage and less cover cropping. Um, that's pretty much expected when we um, the surface kind of gets that sealing and then the water tends to run off rather than infiltrate down into the soil. The roots of the cover crops will help that water to infiltrate down through the soil. Um, for these two, and then also for the perennial system where we would expect the most to infiltrate through. And it was interesting how we saw those effects during the following summer corn growth, not just when those cover crops and roots were in the field. One quick question I have for the panel of um, farmers that were managing the land. Maybe it was too soon to tell, but I was wondering if during the dry parts of the year, if you noticed any difference between how the corn was growing in the fields that had cover crops versus the ones that didn't have as much cover crop biomass. This was a, probably a bad year for that because we had perfect moisture for corn. <laughs> At least I did on my farm. It was like it was an irrigated farm this year. It rained. We had perfect rains when the corn needed it. The, uh, it less, less perfect in, uh, in around Frederick. Um, you know, it, it's interesting you mentioned the kind of the, the yield with the um, um, kind of with the different uh, moisture uh, kind of retention. Um, you know, it, like people were noticing that there were good mounds, um, um, differences in the height of the corn in the different plots. Uh, and you could see them from the road. So like I'd, I'd neighbors stop and say like, well, why do you have a big mound in, in the middle of your field? Um, so it, it, there, there was a difference. Um, less so in yield uh, for whatever reason, and maybe it's just kind of multivariate, uh, couldn't really uh, discern it, but, but in terms of, of noticeable difference, in terms of, of kind of plant height, sort of thing. And how about for you, David? Um, we were, we're actually very close to where um, Aaron's farm is, and we fell in that same perfect year, it seemed like. Um, we were getting weekly rains, never really suffered any uh, drought-type symptoms this year, so kind of a bad year to compare that. But generally, you would think you would certainly get higher moisture content where the biomass from the cover crops um, protected the soil. How about on the flip side in the Salisbury area, was, were there points where there was too much rain? And did you notice if the cover crops helped with that at all? Or if there was any impact? Uh, typically, we, we always have a little bit better moisture in the soil where there is cover crop. But again, this year, um, even though we had very sandy soil, it was um, just so timely, the rain was, and didn't see much drought effect at all. Hoping that happens again. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to be that good again here. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either. Maybe in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs>
Any other questions before we move on? All right, well, Aaron, um, do you wanna talk a little bit about weed management and um, especially how you navigate reduced tillage in organic um, production? Sure. Um, yeah, the reduced tillage is, requires really good cover crops and I don't seem, I, one year I had good rye to roll for soybeans and had a good experience, but um, uh, last year, not so much. I think our cover crops were pretty crappy in fall of 20. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not there on reduced, well, I, I do reduce tillage. <laughs> I don't moldboard plow or chisel plow. Um, but as far as no-till, no that's where I'm trying to head. Um, but even my cover crops this year don't look good enough. I don't think just kind of walking the fields right now and looking at them, I'm kind of worried about next year, not, not being able to do no-till like I want. Um, but as far as I, I would, most people would probably call me conventional till with the organic. Um, I generally disc everything twice. Um, I don't need to plow because my soil is pretty sandy. Um, so Sarah, I sent you some pictures. I don't know on email, but, um, I should, I'm not savvy enough to figure out how to post them in my, like on zoom, uh, like while I'm presenting, but some of these might be like a picture of my row crop flamer and, um, some flamed, um, okay. I'll try to pull them up. Give me one second. It, no big deal if it doesn't work, but, um, so the weed control tools I have, which I have keep adding to the toolbox. Um, so I have a row crop flamer with, um, um, it matches my planter. So it's a 12 row flamer with, uh, you know, one torch over top of each row. It, band, it does a band of, you know, probably eight inches to 12 inches, depending on, you know, that's actually what the flame's hitting. And sometimes the heat goes out and kills more like little weeds. Um, so that's one of my implements. Um, I guess the, well, the next one is obviously a row crop cultivator. And I finally ended up buying a, a, a buffalo cultivator that has um, cutting coulters. It can be used in, in pretty much pretty high residue. Um, it can be, it does well in, you know, where there's less residue, it does well with high residue. Um, and there's a lot of different settings on it. It has cutaway discs where you can pull soil away from the row and then you no, that's like for a first cultivation. The second cultivation, you can throw dirt back on the row and kind of hill up the dirt over the weeds. Um, or you can take the disc off and just use the cutting culture um, and the it's got one sweep, like in a no-till situation. Um, so I, then my final tool is we bought a weed zapper, um, which is an electric weeder. It's a, this massive generator that goes behind the tractor and um, a toolbar with a copper pipe that goes out front um, to, to actually electrocutes weeds. Um, generally, you're gonna use it in soybeans where you have weeds over the canopy. So the pipe is gonna to touch the weeds and kill them. Um, so there's my row crop flamer and a pick um, or flaming corn there. Um, and I can, so I flame corn, since corn still has the growth point below the ground um, up to what about six leaves, you can flame corn Generally I do it, so I'm like burning the corn off. It sounds crazy, um, but uh, there's another picture of corn. I don't know if Sarah has that one yet. Yeah, so that's corn like a few days after flaming. If you zoom in, you can see, uh, this was a pretty weedy field. Like there's a lot of jimson weed and, and pig weed coming up in there, um, but not, a, you know, you can see that it's dead around the corn in a band. Um, so the cultivator is going to, I'm going to come later with my cultivator and knock those um, row middles out, but there's none around the corn. So I can wait longer to cultivate um, until the corn gets tall. And then I'm, you know, I'm going to end up covering less corn with, with dirt. Um, so it, it, otherwise cultivation is going to be real tedious. If I, if I didn't flame it, I have to come in and cultivate the corn when it's really young, because those, those weeds would have been in with the corn and, you know, it would need to be cultivated right in that picture right then to, because those weeds are, you know, they would very quickly get over, you know, too big for a cultivator to cover. Um, so that's how the flaming work. Um, so where was it? So, um, so that's what I do in corn. And then we have a, another picture of the soybeans that had been, I don't know if you got that one. 
Um, so that is a picture, if, you, if we can zoom in. Yeah, so those soybeans, so with soybeans, you can't flame them. You can't touch a true leaf with a flame because it'll kill them. Um, so I'm generally out there as right as, as soon as I see cotyledons cracking the ground, I'm, I'm out there that day flaming um, or earlier, but generally I want to wait as long as I can for as many weeds to flush as possible, you know, so I can kill them. But there's a, you know, you can see the band around the soybean rose is pretty clean. And then, um, you know, it's not in the middles and, and you can also see the residue there that's left. This was uh, actually double crop soybeans after wheat. Um, so the cultivator I have will work in that residue. Um, you know, a regular s tine or Danish tine cultivator wouldn't do very well in that situation. It would probably, you know, hang up and ball up on all that residue and cause a problem. Um, so if, you know, if you're gonna do no-till or like minimum till where you're just disking, you um, need the, uh, high residue cultivator where it has the single sweep and the, the cutting culture that'll cut through that residue. Aaron, uh, you, you want to comment on the usefulness or lack thereof of a flame weeder when you have a lot of residue in a kind of a almost no-till situation with more residue on the surface? Um, in terms of setting your field on fire? Yeah, even this amount of residue, um, if you go in the you know, I, I generally am out there right at dusk. So that first picture we had of flaming was corn at dusk. You know, so then you're, the, the field is, you're starting to get some dampness out there. Um, or I start really early in the morning and cut off about 9 a.m. when the wind picks up. Because otherwise, even, you know, you can see a little bit of residue in that picture. That's going to catch on fire. I mean, you're going to have little tiny fires all through the field if you keep flaming into the day uh, you, where you have the wind. Um, so, I mean, if I'm planning to flame up till lunchtime, I'll, I'll go around the perimeter of the field first, because that's where the problem's going to be with this kind of residue. Um, you know, it's going to, um, you know, blow to your ditches or your road edges, and that's, that's a problem. I, I've, I've stomped out plenty of fires <laughs> um, in the past few years. It's, I mean, I'm always trying to push the limit, and I shouldn't be, um, but it is, it can be dangerous if you don't you know, kind of plan out how you're going to do it. Um, but with more residue, like no-till, um, I mean, you would have to have a really dewy morning um, to do it. Because I've, I have, well, there's an example this year, I set a field on fire of uh, wheat straw. I no-till soybeans into wheat straw. And this was, I didn't flame. I knew better than that, but I was zapping um, in the afternoon. It was weed zapping and um, that caught the straw on fire with a weed zapper. So even, I mean, there's no flame involved until, you know, one of those lightning bolts goes down and, you know, somehow hits the dry stuff as it, as it goes down a weed. Um, so even that machine should be done early in the morning on, you know, big residue like wheat straw. I just thought, I thought we should mention that before everybody goes out and starts flaming <laughs> in yeah. combination with cover crop residues. Yeah, and I mean, now if you're like moldboard plowing and don't have any residue, it's not an issue, except still around the edge. I mean, you have weeds, dry dry matter around your ditches and field edges that can be a real problem. Um, but but it it's fine with some, you know, like that soybean picture had a, quite a bit more residue. Um, you'll have like a little bit of burning when you come back on the next pass and it's usually has burned itself out. Like there's just not enough residue to, but unless it's, you know, has dried out big time in the, in the late morning and you have a lot of wind, I mean, it, it can spread. Um, so it's just better to do it. I and mean, then you can start burning your plants if you have enough heat around them. Uh, you don't want that. So it's better to just do a four hour window early in the morning and you know, you're just not gonna go all day. It's one of those, that's why I have a 12 row weed or a uh, flamer <laughs> so, I can, um, so I can keep up. Um, of course, the, I wouldn't be flaming soybeans with at this stage anyway, so. At what speed are you traveling, Aaron? Uh, about four miles an hour. Have you varied that at all to see if it made it um, better or worse? If I, yeah, if I have some big weeds I come up to, like I'll slow down. Um, it, it depends. I three Some people run three and a half pretty consistently. Um, four, it just depends on your weed size and what stage. But uh, generally with soybeans, I'm, I'm waiting a week to um, to plant them after I till, 
So I'm going to get, I want a weed flush. You know, I want some weeds there when I flame. Because if you go out and you disc and plant soybeans the same day, um, and then you, you're going to have to flame about four days later, uh, to, you know, like in June, their soybeans will be cracking the ground pretty quick. I mean, you're not going to get enough um, weed flush there. It's, it's kind of a weird mentality to think you need to plant into weeds or at least weeds that are starting, but that's the flamer is not going to do anything if there's no weeds there, or at least even weeds in like that white hair stage where you can barely see them, you're going to kill them too. Um, I mean, you don't want to go out there. I made the mistake this year. I, I kind of went like two weeks. I was trying to play around with it and that was too long. I was planting soybeans into, into green, you know, a field that had green in it. And that was, I, I couldn't, I got, I was able to kill some of them, but it just seemed like the weeds, it seems like a week seems like the sweet spot on uh, from tillage to planting. So you can kind of wait a week and it gives you a little more flexibility that way too. But with corn, I'm, I'm usually tilling and planting the same day because I'm with the corn, I'm, I'm letting it grow and flaming it off. Um, you know, so the weeds get a chance to grow for sure on corn. In that photo of the corn, how, um, how soon after flaming was that picture taken? Um, I think that was probably three days, something like that. Yeah, it, it'll start greening up the next day. I mean, maybe towards the end of the day, but two days, you're definitely starting to see some. And um, I mean, some people cross flame. Mine, mine's just not set up that way. They cross flame at the base of the plant. And I guess if you had that set up, you might not burn the corn off as bad, but um, that's just the way I have it set up. Uh, Aaron, uh, that reminds me of a study I did in Africa many years ago where uh, villagers would complain that another farmer's cattle ate their corn. And they would take them to the local court and sue them at the, with the chief. And we did a study with, in terms of what age, at what age did that really impact their, their corn yields? And it's exactly what you're talking about. You know, when the corn is small, you can eat it off or burn it off and the growing points down there. And it really is not going to impact the yields measurably. Uh, right. I like to, I kind of like to go three leaves, four leaves. I kind of don't like uh, to. You mean leaf collars? Yeah. Actual leaf collars? Yeah, that's getting late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this corn was fairly small, but it, yeah. um, I mean, you don't want the growth point above the ground, but the, the longer you wait, you know, you're going to impact it more. The earlier you can put the better. Um, but you want to wait long enough that there's, all the weeds are going to flush, you know, as many as possible. Um, I've tried to flame sorghum before and that didn't work as well. It didn't come back very well. I guess there's just not as much energy in the seedling to come back. It, it really seemed to really set it back. I mean, I don't, I don't grow sorghum anymore, but when I did, I tried it. Um, so that's the early weed control is the most important and, and the flaming seems to work for me. Um, I've, you know, no till if we have a good cover crop and can roll it down, you know, you're kind of taking place of this flame and you don't, shouldn't need to flame in no till if you have a good cover crop um, and a good stand. Um, but in, in conventional, I mean, so I've messed, you know, I've had a rotary hoe in the past and um, I've kind of built a little in row tine weeder. Um, they, for me, I mean, I know, I know a lot of organic farmers just use rotary hose and time weeders and they go over the do blind cultivation at like this stage multiple times. Um, it's just never seemed to work that well for me. The flamer works. I mean, it, it definitely kills whatever weeds are there. Um, you know, if you get a rain the afternoon after you time weed, they, all the weeds might reroot. Uh, I guess I'm just not, never one to fool with all that timing of, um, I mean, the timing's hard enough with the flamer, but uh, you know it's going to kill, and then you know, it's just no question. What is the price tag on a, a flamer the size of yours? Um, so I bought a 12, no, a six row kit um, from Red Dragon, and I think it was like $11,000. Um, now, if you're real savvy, you could probably go out and build your own torches and set up the regulator. I mean, it came with everything I needed to, for 12 torches. Now they call it a six row kit because they're cross flaming, you know, two torches per row. Um, but I, I, I just wanted to set it up this way. Um, so it seems to work for me. Well, it's cheaper to 
set up a 12 row with a six, you know, with just 12 torches instead of 24. Um, so that was, but that, that included those like skid legs and everything. Mine, I just, I took an old uh, cultivator frame. Um, I kind of like it to roll on the ground like that. Um, it seemed like the flame, well, you've had the flamer at Lesrec years ago. I guess you've seen that one, but that one, it seems like it all, um, you know, you turn your tractor wheel and the flamer will move a foot in the back because the, the torches are sticking mm -hmm. far behind it. Um, I set up this different setup where I've got stuff rolling in the ground. I've got uh, like guidance coulters so the cultivator, the frame won't shift to the side because it's important to stay right on the row, you know, if that, that's where you're, where you're trying to kill. Um, so I, I don't know, after I borrowed the universities for years and messed with that one, but this kind of decided I had to have something rolling in the ground to be able to stop that shifting back and forth. Of course, with a cross flaming, you're, you're flaming a lot more area. I think, you know, when you, um, you can be, it depends on how you have it set. I never saw any reason, but since I'm going to cultivate to be able to flame the whole field, it just takes a lot of propane. I figure I'm using six or seven gallons an acre. And I could probably cut that down. I just, I don't know. I haven't messed with, with that, like changing the regulator or going, you know, you get over four and a half miles an hour. It's kind of hard to stay straight anyway, you know, when you need to be that precise. How about the um, <clears throat> high residue cultivator? What's the price tag on that? And does that have uh, guidance cultures to keep it straight? Um, well, it's got hmm. 12 cult or 13 cultures in the ground already. Um, that's, that's pretty steady then, right? It's not going to move. Um, it's, <clears throat> I bought a used one that was rebuilt for like 20,000, but a new one's like 40 some thousand. The only one, that's the a only ones, row. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's a 12 row though. Uh, the only one I, I was looking for them because uh, we have this problem uh, and uh, the only ones I could find were out in Nebraska. Yeah, this one came from Nebraska from this, probably the same place you looked at. Could uh, be. Yeah. So, so was, was that uh, expensive to get it to you? Uh, yeah, it was probably a few thousand dollars in shipping. I, yeah. maybe a couple thousand. Um, and now I've, I've bought six rows in the past. You can find a six row for a used one for like you know, five or six thousand um, dollars. Probably a new six rows pushing twenty now. I would think. Uh, yeah, they're not cheap compared to a, an S time. <laughs> How much horsepower do you need to pull? Uh, say the six row. Oh, uh, well, it's more about the weight. Um, yeah. Because my, let's see, I was pulling a like a Henniker six row with a eighty horsepower John Deere, like eighty PTO. It could pick as long as you had enough weight on the front. I think they weigh about well my 12 row weighs like seven thousand pounds but it's heavy i think the six rows are going to be between three and four thousand so whatever your you know the smallest tractor they'll pick that up you know it's not much to pull right um, it's probably almost easier to pull them than a s time with all those little teeth in the ground you run it a couple of inches deep the sweeps the, sorry. How deep do you run the sweeps? Um, well, when I, I don't know, it's I'm trying to think what the setting is on it. Um, probably like two or three inches to start. Uh, and then, you know, we're, I could go down to four inches if I really need to throw some dirt up later. Um, pro probably two inches. I mean, you, ha you have to make sure they're getting in the ground. Have you used it with a heavy cover crop residue? And, and how much residue do you have after you finished? I've... I've tried it. Let's see. Did I ever trying to think if I ever took the, yes, I did because I, um, but I wouldn't say it was real heavy. It was a rye residue that held, held some weeds back. Um, but I used the, the disc killers to throw, cause I had some, I still had some crabgrass in the soybean row that had popped through that residue mat. So I was trying to cover that. And I, I had the disc killers turned in, um, and I was throwing dirt up. So, I mean, there wasn't any residue left once I went through it. But you could, if you took the hillers off, you, you could definitely undercut the residue. So, does anybody have any other questions for Aaron before we turn it over to Shannon? Yeah, I would have. Uh, yep. Lane Hammer here. Um, specifically, because I'm interested in it, um, has he had experience with Palmer Amaranth? Yeah, I have some in, in patches. Um, I mean, I, a cultivator kills it just like any red root pigweed or anything, but it does grow a little faster. So it's, it's 
you know, you have to be on top of it more. Um, I mean, that field where the corn picture, the, the flamed off corn, that, that field has some palmer. It's probably one of my worst fields. That, that particular part of the field didn't have any. Um, but, you know, in the soybeans, the weed zapper takes care of the palmer, no problem. Um, but, but in corn, it can get ahead of you if you don't do the flaming. I mean, one year I didn't flame. I decided I'd cut corners and not flame, and that was a mistake. <laughs> I definitely had plenty of palmer that year. Um, and I would say it, it probably, if you're going to see any pigweed escape later, it is going to be Palmer. It just seems to be, you know, grow quicker and compete with corn or it, maybe it, it doesn't mind uh, germinating later or at weird times. So you, you will, I'll still have a few Palmer plants in a cornfield. Um, but like I say, I can, if I, with that early weed control, I get rid of most of them. So really it takes the combination of the flamer plus your, your electric weed. Yeah. Well, the electric are in the, in the soybeans, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's been a True. big, because soybeans are generally where you see the weeds in organic fields. <laughs> you see, it looks more like weeds than soybeans and the zapper can take care of that. So that's the one or two years you can, you know, if you have two years of soybeans or, or you know, double, I have double crop soybeans and then full season and then corn. So at two out of three years, I can get rid of, you know, tall broadleafs. Uh, cockleburr is a problem. I can't usually, it's hard, cockleburr seems to like to grow about the same height as soybeans. It's generally hard to get it sometimes. Thank you. Um, and then we had a question in the chat. How would you address stands of Canada thistle and Johnson grass? Um, I don't have either of those. I do have one patch of Johnson grass. I've been digging out by hand every year I get a chance to, and I've got it down you know, a tiny little area right now. Um, but I don't, I don't have, I mean, I guess if you did a lot of no-till, you could get Canada thistle. Um, but in conventional tillage, I mean, where I'm tilling, I don't, I don't get those. So, but a, a weed zapper would definitely take care of either of those. Um, yeah, I can't speak to Johnson grass much. There's just not much around our area. It's been eradicated pretty well. I have a question as well. With the spring oats, you found somebody to buy yours, right? So who, who purchases your organic spring oats? Uh, well, I use them in feed. So that's, I mean, I make, I make feed on the farm for um, feed customers. I don't have my own animals, but um, yeah. So that's, I use, my, use the oats in my own feed. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment about weed management. We'll let Shannon go ahead and um, talk a little bit about the economics and business planning. And Shannon, if you wanted to introduce yourself first. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon Dill. I'm with University of Maryland Extension and happy to be here today. Um, we've been creating crop budgets within University of Maryland Extension since 2008. And every so often we will update our organic crop budgets as well as um, our cover crop budgets. And so today I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, how to create these budgets, especially for yourself. So the ones that we use, we have to create a number of assumptions because we're not a real farm. We have to make some assumptions based on knowledge and maybe some general uh, generalities. So um, I'm going to just share with you some of the basics of putting together a uh, crop budget and then be able to share with you um, where those are. Okay, sorry about this. It didn't start at one. Are you, you're seeing my uh, screen now? Yeah, yeah, looks good. Okay. All right. So um, organic crop budgeting, we updated these in early uh, or in late 2020, early 2021. So we're going to be using those same numbers. Um, what enterprise budgets are, I'll talk a little bit about uh, enterprise, uh, parts of the enterprise budget, and then we're going to show some examples. So when I talk about enterprise budgets, they are a listing of your estimated costs. Um, and income based on a particular enterprise. And you do have to select a unit. So in our grain budgets, we're doing it in bushels per acre. If 
you have livestock, sometimes it's per head, maybe in dairy, it's per hundred weight of milk. So um, lots of different enterprise budgets are based on the different commodity and very commodity specific marketing. So for ours, we're going to be doing this on a, it's going to be one acre of conventional and we're going to do it um, per bushel. Uh, let's see. So enterprise budgets really help with determining the profitability of one enterprise versus another. For grain, it's really important to know that break-even cost. When you start marketing grain and talking about prices, having that idea of what your price points are and where break-even is, is really important. Um, it understands the input structure in place, and it can also help you plan for crop rotations. So. Um, as we go through the example, uh, and as you're creating your own crop budgets or enterprise budgets, you wanna have some specific objectives in mind. Uh, some of the receipts and costs can be difficult to estimate. Some are easier to estimate than others. And um, again, what we're gonna be sharing is something that's sort of our estimation of what uh, organic producers might um, have as far as income and costs based on what information that we have. So for income, uh, we do like to determine some yield goals. So you will have a, a you'll need to, to estimate a yield goal in mind. And then um, you'll also have to select a price. And so an example here that we use is um, for bushels, Maybe our expected is 100 bushels per acre for corn, organic grain. Um, and then at the, at the bottom of the enterprise budgets, you'll have see the sensitivity analysis. What happens if we don't hit that yield and we're less than that yield? Or what happens if it's more than that yield? I would also highly recommend following some of the grain prices. Um, you know, corn organic markets are much more regionalized, even though our conventional grain is very regionalized. I think organic is even more and very market specific, but following some of these national pricing to get a handle on what the prices are. Um, there's a couple examples here. There's USDA has a price report they put out. Um, Canada has one, and then there's one out of Iowa that's really helpful in at least following what national markets are doing and quoting. So that's the income side, and I'll, I'll be showing an example in an Excel spreadsheet of, of what that revenue may look like. The next section of the enterprise budget that we're going to show are the variable costs, and these are expenses that vary with the output within a production period. So the more, more acres I have, the more seed I need, the more fuel I use, the more um, you know nutrients I need or lime I need or disease and insect control I may need. So those are the variable costs. And um, again, they vary with the level of output or the level of units. And in this example, I've done a screenshot of our Excel spreadsheet. And this is for organic conventional corn with poultry litter. And there's a fall legume crop that we're gonna be crediting for our nitrogen amount. So um, you can see here that uh, for the green, we've got our bushel. We're expecting um, 100 uh, bushels per acre. As our yield goal, we've got an expected price of $9. We also are adding in the cover crop payment that we would be using and receiving, which is $55 an acre. Uh, we've got our variable costs of crimson clover, barley. We're going to plant at 32,000 uh, kernels or seeds per acre. And then we've got our fertilizer and, and lime costs. Uh, we'll be using poultry litter and we're valuing it at $25 a ton at two and a half tons. We also are purchasing crop insurance on it. And we do add this interest on operating capital. A lot of people take out say a line of credit or some kind of purchase that they do um, for the early season to purchase their inputs. And so that's what that cost is there. So you can see here our estimations for total variable costs for one acre of conventional corn with poultry litter 
and a fall legume crop is $241.67. Again, some costs may be easy to find estimates. You can call around, you can get price quotes. Um, some may be more difficult to estimate. How much time am I gonna spend out there? How do I value my time? Uh, what are the land costs related to my, my operation? So again, some variable costs are pretty easy to, to outline and, and some may be a little bit more difficult. I would say that over the years, if you start creating these and you compare them year after year, you get a lot better at putting numbers to each of these activities. And I have producers in the county that even include like their satellite radio or their cell, they, they attribute some percentage of their um, communications to each bushel and to each acre so they can cover all of those operating costs that they have. So we're gonna move on. We've talked about income. We've talked about variable costs. The next is fixed costs. So this is um, also uh, talked about as overhead. Um, these are expenses that do not vary with the level of output. So no matter how many acres I'm growing, I still have my building costs, my machinery costs, I pay my taxes, I have insurance and I have mortgage. So those are what is considered um, for economists as fixed costs. Um, and again, sometimes uh, they, they can be somewhat difficult to um, estimate they can be allocated over each of your crops. So say you use one tractor on three different enterprises on the farm, you could credit each one of those enterprises. Um, and they really vary by farm because it depends on the size of equipment you need. Is it new, is it used, is it paid off? Um, is it borrowed, is it, is it a custom operator? And um, what kind of field operations you have. So what we end up using, and I'll, I'll show in the crop budgets, is custom rates. And that's a really good way for us in universities or government to um, value fixed costs. But I would encourage you as a producer to start putting some of your own numbers onto those fixed costs because they definitely vary operation to operation. This is the dirty five, and, and this is also often listed out as um, the, the fixed costs, and I wouldn't be a good economist or a presentation without at least sharing depreciation, interest, repairs, maintenance, taxes, and insurance. So there's some ways to kind of, um, and when I say allocate, I mean you have this one set of fixed costs, but you know it's not fair to corn if you give all those fixed costs to corn. You need to be able to figure out, okay, well, 60% um, of my operation is corn, 40% is beans. Then, then I could take that tractor and say, okay, maybe I split it out a little bit, or I have more field activities in corn than I do in soybeans, or some kind of way that makes sense to, to your operation in valuing um, that fixed cost. So custom rates is something that we do within the university every other year. And it is a survey that we do of custom operators, of farmers that says, okay, um, bush hogging, what do you charge to bush hog per acre? Um, some is like skilled labor is by the hour. Uh, maybe it's combining is, is by the acre. And that includes the equipment, it includes the fuel, and it includes the labor. So that is what a, a custom rate is. And we, again, do that every other year. We do the survey and we publish it on the, the even years. So um, we use these and you can find the custom rates at this go.umb.edu backslash grain marketing on our grain marketing page. This is also where the crop budgets are. You can download those in PDF or in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and again, it makes our job a lot easier when we're creating these, these budgets. And I think they're, they're more accurate. So here's an example of our corn um, conventional that I showed earlier, the variable cost. Here are the fixed costs. So I have fixed costs of the fall cover crop. Then I have the corn uh, field activities that will be happening. And so you can see like um, a couple of times we're going over the field more than once. Uh, we've included everything from the fall cover crop before 
to the um, manure uh, operations, to harvest, to hauling. The land charge is a, it may not be your rental rate, but it is at least some, some kind of price that you put on the property um, on a per acre basis to um, allocate that expense. So for us, um, we're using $150 um, as a as a land charge. Michelle, we go down. This is David. Is is that land charge um, taxes? Would that be a proxy for taxes, or is there something else that you have in mind? For that? So I've I the economists that I've talked to um, and that I learned from use it kind of as an opportunity cost. Uh, it it may not be your taxes, although that would be something that I would think about. I would also think about if it's a rental rate or land values. Um, of course, if I'm going to purchase land, um, that would be a much higher value. I mean, it wouldn't make the budget really work. It wouldn't be fair to the crop to put that full amount on it. Um, so I, I've been explained to that that land charge, and, and we've even talked within our own organization of what that number should be. It was $90 for a number of years when we were doing these budgets, and we upped them um, just in the, in the last couple of years. So it should be some kind of opportunity cost, some value you put on there. And it could be maintenance, it could be property tax, that kind of thing. I, got it. I think organic land rent's gone up quite a bit in some areas, well over like, like 250 or 200, and I don't know. Absolutely. With, with organic prices going up, it's, but that, that, you know, that could change. <laughs> and we see the same thing um, when, when people call land rent, Custom rates and land rent are two of the biggest questions I get in the extension office from both farmers and landowners um, or custom operators. And I tell people that in my county, people pay everywhere from zero to, you know, the highest bidder of, you know, over $200. So it really, um, you know, we have some properties that have maybe they're smaller, harder to access, not as good as soil types not as many farmers in the area. Um, and then of course, the relationship of mowing, snow removal, all of the things that kind of happen with that kind of relationship. So um, I try not to go by what the land, the, the state land rent is. The bottom part of the budgets, I try to include a sensitivity analysis and this is sort of the what if, scenarios. So um, you can see if we have a yield of 100 bushels and we have a price of $9, what our profit per acre is. And you can see, well, what happens if price goes down or fuel goes down and, and what that sensitivity analysis is. And I just think it's, it's always a good way to kind of think about those what ifs. And especially when you start putting numbers on things to be able to look at the range where they could be. And so this automatically does prices 12% fluctuation and then yields 25% fluctuation. And that, that's somewhat arbitrary numbers. Um, and then of course we have assumptions. So this is um, our estimates. This is what we're considering when we created this um, budget. So, you put the budget together and I've done a really good job of getting my numbers together and I feel really good about it. Now it's kind of time to, to do some ratios, some analysis of, okay, I know my variable costs, I know my fixed costs, let me think about pricing. So in this example, we had our fixed cost, we add that with our variable costs, we have our units produced, which is 100 bushels per acre. And so um, our Unit costs are seven dollars and thirty six cents. So that's that's our break even for the example that I was showing here. Um, you can break that down a little bit more. So we like to look at variable costs per unit sold. So maybe I bought a lot of equipment lately. I've got some new paint out there. Or I've added a, a a big land charge. Can I at least cover my variable costs? And that is one of the things that we do tell people, if you can at least cover your variable costs of production, you really wanna consider discontinuing that enterprise or, or rethinking that enterprise. The next is your fixed cost. So that's your overhead um, per unit. 
And so you definitely want to cover this number. So that, that pays your mortgage, that pays your equipment. Then your total cost per unit, which I just showed in the previous slide, and then your profit per unit sold. So what that says is that with my estimations that I would be making $2.19 per bushel if, if that budget works out to the penny. Um, that's what I would be profiting. And this is what the full spreadsheet looks like. And we've got this analysis. If you download the Excel, it automatically calculates all of those things. Um, you're able to go in and make changes based on your estimations of you know, quantity, price, maybe changing products, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we do these for conventional every year. We do organic. Um, kind of along with it at least every other year when we update the custom rate survey. And then these are the three crops that we have listed online um, in the spreadsheets. So we've got organic conventional corn, we've got um, soybean, organic conventional soybeans with fall cover and organic no-till soybeans. And then I'll just share the uh, chart here where you can just look at comparisons of um, prices. So there's income, here's your variable costs, your fixed costs and your net income for the three organic um, examples that we have. Are those all at the same yield level? No, no. So they're they're all uh, for the the market price or market yield, and I can show. Um, I mean, I mean, the bushels of soybeans per acre are they the same for the three systems? Uh, for the two, the no, I think the conventional one has a higher yield. Let me see here. Um, for conventional soybeans, we have. 35 bushels to the acre and, oh no, we kept it the same and 35 bushels per acre for um, no-till. Where we get into the reason there's a little bit more, it looks like no-till, we have a higher seeding rate than what we do for the conventional tillage. So there was a, a higher cost in that one. And what I can do is I can share the Excel spreadsheet here. And this is what it looks like. So um, you can go through the assumptions. So here's our introduction. Um, here's our conventional corn, which I used as the example. And then we've got the conventional soybeans with a fall cover crop. And so see, you can see here the 35 and we're expecting $18 a bushel. And these spreadsheets are all available on the extension grain marketing website, right? Mm -hmm. Very helpful. And the 35 bushels, how did you choose that as an example? So we kind of, we, we create these um, with the best information we have. We have them, we work with producers, we work with um, service centers, you know, ag service providers, custom applicators to get these numbers. And I think when we created these last year, I, I think I did share it with Aaron and Steve just to kind of proof through and, and double check. Um, so we're, and that's the one thing whenever I show this, uh, there's at least someone that says, well, that's not my cost or that's not my price. And, and um, it's at least a basis to kind of get started on. And then we just have some. Yeah, you know, those yields seem realistic to me over, I mean, we're talking about multiple land types and soil types, and that, that's a pretty good average, I think. Now, of course, prices have jumped way up in the past, mm -hmm. so, which is a good thing. Great. 
Thanks so much, Shannon. And I did put that link in the chat for Thank that you. website where you can find the resources. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to be conscious of everybody's time. Neve, did you want to share um, anything about the Future Harvest <clears throat> upcoming um, workshops or anything related to this project? Um, sure, I'll just mention briefly that, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the date set yet, but since there is an interest in these research trials um, that are happening informally and both formally with organic grain farmers that are doing minimal till or no till, we plan to do two workshops in the coming year on organic grain farms that are experimenting with that and also talking about market outlets and buyers connected to organic grain in the region. So stay tuned for that. We'll, we'll be sending out emails with that information. Um, and we also have a conference coming up in January, which will focus on some organic grain. And I just thought I'd mention briefly that when organic grain farmers have converted over to organic production, there's you have your commodity crop um, system where you can sell your organic grain, but then it also up, it's opens up an opportunity to um, sell to the regional grain market. There are quite a few efforts afoot in the Chesapeake region for people that are um, producing and processing grain for human consumption. And so Aaron Cooper is one of the farmers who is straddling both worlds. He's selling some to the commodity crop market and some to the local market which also has very attractive prices. Um, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing just briefly, Erin, um, I don't know, there, I know there's not much time here, but uh, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about um, some of the prices you're receiving for grain that you're selling for the local human consumption market. Yeah, so that's mainly wheat um, and a little tiny bit of like open pollinated corn so the wheats, you know, where organic feed wheats, probably $10, $11 a bushel, I'm getting at least double that food grade, but that's kind of on a small scale. I think if you're going to sell a whole tractor trail load of wheat, like food grade, I've, I've heard maybe 17 a bushel. So you, you're going to kind of be in the middle, but, uh, you know, selling it more locally to, you know, smaller millers and things like that, the price is definitely higher. And, you know, corn, you know, we're like 50 cents a pound on this right out of the field, open pollinated corn. Of course, it yields like 40 bushels to the acre. So, it, you know, it's, it, I still think I make a little bit better on that corn than I do on um, feed corn, though. And for people that are transitioning small acreage at a time, that's an interesting outlet that people could look into. And we're hoping to be able to eventually offer some information for people interested in selling in some of these other market areas too. Um, but uh, for example, Migrash Farm in Baltimore is purchasing from regional growers that are doing organic grain and acreage of about 10 acres is the minimum that he's looking for and not a whole lot higher than that. But um, there you know, are some other opportunities that open up for people who are, are going into organic grain production. Um, that's worth mentioning. Um, so I think that's it from um, my end and um, thanks Sarah. Sure, yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming and I'm happy to stick around a little if anybody has further questions, but if you have to leave, I understand that. And thank you all for attending. Thanks Sarah, Ray and um, Dave, Aaron and David. I want to second Sarah's thanks to everybody who attended and who participated. Appreciate it.